Welcome to the broadcast and our conversation of the art of dance. So we've actually been able to marry baseball and ballet and now um, this cultural exchange that'll be happening is just another opportunity. The art of dance, next. Welcome to Talk About Our Times, I'm Lich. D'Artagnan Reed is here. He's the executive and artistic director of the Hartford City Ballet, their main office in downtown Hartford. D'Artagnan began dancing with the School of Hartford Ballet, where he studied a variety of dance. In 1999, he joined the American Ballet Theater Company, becoming the founder of the Hartford City Ballet and School, following his time at the American Ballet in 2005. And I am pleased to be joined by D'Artagnan Reed. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to have you here. When did dance come to you? So I've been involved um, in dance, specifically ballet, for the past 27 years. And when I was eight years old, I was a student uh, in the Hartford Public School System at Kennelly Eleanor B. School. And the Hartford Ballet, the school of the Hartford Ballet, uh, came into our school and they gave a presentation about the opportunities of dancing ballet uh, and that opportunity was um, to audition for a scholarship. And so uh, my third grade teacher, because um, a bunch of the boys were talking that boy talk about ballet is just for girls, there's nothing to see here. Um, she really uh, had a convincing case, uh, Mrs. Andrews, for the fact that if you don't go and try to be a part of this, this tremendous opportunity that they're offering you, your life will probably never be the same. And so a handful of us, after school, went up and auditioned for what would later, for me, uh, impact um, my very life. Uh, I didn't know right away um, that I wanted to be a ballet dancer. I just knew that while I was playing baseball and doing a variety of other tasks um, that our parents uh, will set you up for, um, ballet started to stand out. It was standing out um, because the opportunity to be on stage, uh, the opportunity to travel, but the opportunity to meet um, people from a very diverse, um, from very diverse backgrounds. When did you know you had something unique as time moved on? Uh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> I don't know uh, that, that, that that realization ever really comes. There's, a, there's an ever-evolving appreciation um, for what we have to offer this art form. Um, the appreciation for me um, just recently was the ability to um, found my found the Har the Hartford the School of Hartford City Ballet, um, and that mission is to give the same opportunity to children. I think it's the the exposure um, that that I'm able to create now um, another ladder of opportunity for young people to to do ballet. Um, I was very fortunate in my own career. Um, uh, simultaneously as the school, the Hartford Ballet, unfortunately closed its doors in, in 1998. Um, us young dancers were pushed out into the wilderness to audition, um, to see what our years of dedication and sacrifice uh, were worth. And I was able to uh, go off for a summer uh, to join the American Ballet Theater in New York City, uh, a very competitive program. Um, and even fewer um, black and brown people represented at that highest level of dancing. And I was subsequently offered a contract to and later performed with that company. Um, and being able to perform with a company like the American Ballet Theater um, that tours the world as much as it did, that tours the states as often as it does, um, to see the impact that dance has in the lives of young people. And I realized that um, when I met my wife, a uh, Japanese dancer, um, that, that opening a school and in fact um, creating a new door, a new ladder of opportunity for exposure. Um, that's my unique, that's what makes me unique. That's my unique um, gift that I'm able to give is the, the continuing opportunity to expose young people to, to potentially a life uh, in ballet. You knew at such a young age though that you wanted to open a school. I did, I did. The, um, the, uh, the American Ballet Theater um, art is, 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 um, is, is at the higher echelon of performing arts in the United States and continues to be. Um, but I didn't see a future for myself as a dancer. Um, very early on when I became a, a professional with the American Ballet Theater, I spent a significant amount of time with smaller regional companies 
and those companies often do and continue to do a lot of community work in public schools, in libraries, and parks, um, and have a real community focus. Um, my parents uh, were both blue collar workers here in Hartford, and uh, they had me in the Boy Scouts, they had me in the baseball, but they created a foundation uh, for community engagement, community involvement, community activism. Um, it's important for people who have opportunities to engage the community, to engage young people. And at every step of my life in Hartford, um, there was somebody who was doing well or somebody who had used that ladder um, to make our parks better, to make our schools better, um, to, in a sense, create um, these, these channels of opportunity for young people. Paramount lesson. As a student, first are 10, and tell me the paramount lesson you learned as a student, and then subsequently the paramount lesson you learned as an artistic director. Discipline. Um, discipline is, is key. Um, uh, so something that we focus on in the School of Harvard City Ballet and something that was, was a focus um, when I was a student at the Hartford Ballet uh, was discipline. You have to, it does take a lot of time to um, train your body to become a dancer, um, but it also takes time and patience to train your mind. And so the marriage between a formal education from middle school to high school to college, um, as well as from pre-professional to professional dancer is important. Um, um, both those tracks take time and take patience. Um, for every Carlos Acosta, for every Sylvie Guillaume who are essentially um, uh, uh, the, the the height of what you could hope to be as a classical ballet dancer, um, there's a number of people who won't get there. And so how do you train yourself as a whole person? Uh, so discipline number one would be, would be that. When you bring together in concert the re requirements, the technical prowess of dance, and you bring them together in concert with one's creative freedom, how so? Um, it's, a, it's a work in progress, um, specifically with the School of Harvard City Ballet year. Um, every year our, our, our dancers, our young professionals get better and better, and so we're able to tell stories um, like The Nutcracker, like Sleeping Beauty, um, with, more, with more of a technical focus on the dancing. Um, uh, these young people, when you, when you start dancing, you're only taking a class or two a week, and as you get older and as you progress, it becomes a weekly uh, commitment, uh, including Saturdays and Sundays in some cases. Um, so watching um, this school, so, um, so for the past eight years now, we've had the opportunity to train dancers from beginning to pre-professional, generally speaking, um, to see an impact, uh, to have an impact um, on a young person training in a pre-professional setting, it's about six years. Um, so we have several young people who for the past eight years have really shown an aptitude to become professional dancers. Um, but along the way, there's been dancers who we've met um, at year three towards the end or at year two towards the end, and we're able to refocus um, and help um, fill in the gap between a professional career as a dancer and as a, um, as a professional career as a, as, a, as a contributing member of society, as a positive member of society, um, which includes school, which includes coming back and teaching younger classes, which includes um, sh uh, sharing the opportunity that they had with the next generation to, to, to dance and to teach and to learn. You take a student from beginning, let's say, to a certain age, in this case, like you said, six to eight years. Now you put him on stage with a partner. Does and how does a partner bring out the best in you, even though you're at your level, which at that time is, is a, I su suspect, excellent? How does a partner, or do you believe that a partner even brings out more of the best of you? Absolutely. Um, and it can be a love-hate relationship. Some of the, the best potatoes you've ever seen danced by Varishnikov and Cynthia Harvey were at the height of a fight that they were having backstage or a disagreement about choreography and what should be executed. Uh, Jose Manuel Carreño, uh, when he's on stage, he inf infamously fights with his partners, trying to maneuver her to do a different step um, and then to see that dynamic happen on stage. Um, for me, um, uh, being able to dance with uh, who is the woman who would later become my wife, um, that was the, the most epic partnership. Um, not only were we able to enjoy each other on stage, enjoy each other's facility and technique, and dance together through modern movements, through classical movements, but we were able to uh, partner in life. 
and we had a singular focus, which was to recreate ladders of opportunity, open doors for young people. Uh, my wife had those opportunities open for her. She's a native of Japan, and she was invited to study at the Vaganova Academy in Russia. And from Russia, she was offered a contract to come dance in New York City. And as soon as she got to New York City, she was also looking into smaller regional companies that had community impacts. So she, for selfish reasons, could experience the American culture and really get a handle on it. Um, and for less so, um, because she really enjoyed working with kids, she always saw herself uh, someday being a family woman and not, per, per, not, not a classical ballerina, per se. <laughs> um, so our, that partnership with my wife, um, which is now going on its 12th year, as well as the incorporation of a ballet school that's also going on its 12th year um, has certainly uh, impacted and shaped my life. Um, I never could have imagined when I was eight years old going upstairs on the advice of my third grade teacher to take this opportunity to audition for a ballet school that would accept me and give me a scholarship, a lifelong scholarship as it turned out um, immediately that summer and on into the new year would expose me to ballets like the Nutcracker that I would for the next 27 years be dancing, be recreating, um, be sharing with audiences here at home and abroad. Um, it's not something I ever could have imagined and I know, um, and God rest her soul, that's exactly what she meant by taking that opportunity um, by the horns and that's something that uh, this partnership with uh, Keiko, my wife and I, are able to do on a daily basis. Yeah, but the pride has to come. The inner happiness comes from within there, Tanya, and to tell you the truth, she would be very proud of you and is proud of you because of the fact that some could have become divas or prima donnas. You went on to, to take that expertise, that artistic prowess, and pass it along. It's, uh, it, it really is, I'm really in a very fortunate position. Um, I've also been able to uh, appreciate from the outside um, what the American Ballet Theater still means to the United States and how it's represented very broadly um, annually for the past five years. School of Hartford City Ballet parents and families are able to take a trip down to Lincoln Center and experience the, the ballet firsthand to take class like I did backstage at Lincoln Center um, to meet some of the celebrities of, of the ballet world today. Um, and in tandem to that, for example, um, we're going to be taking the girls to Cuba uh, this, this coming April as part of a Cuba educational travel. Um, we, when Keiko and I, my wife, um, first started um, partnering, we did an um, international exchange with Cubans down in Mexico. So we created a five-city tour, and we essentially toured with Cubans um, who were unable to enter the United States due to the embargo. Um, and since that embargo has, has shifted, um, we are now in a position to do some really fascinating cultural exchanges. Um, the other um, form of uh, physical exertion that the Cubans really appreciate on a national scale is baseball. So we've actually been able to marry baseball and ballet and now um, this cultural exchange that'll be happening is just another opportunity. Um, one that didn't exist for me as a young person, but an, an opportunity that we can, we, we are creating for our young people. Um, the, it, the, the ballet um, has been very generous to me and my family. No boundary lines at any level. Absolutely any not, level. absolutely not. D'Artagnan, to be a great dancer, you have, well, I should say it this way, to be a great dancer, you can't do it without. To be a great dancer, you can't do it without sacrifice. And um, time away from friends and family is, is the ultimate sacrifice. Um, your, your 27 hour days in a studio, your, constantly on the road, um, you're constantly working on your body, um, is, um, can be challenging. And, I, and for me personally, I knew that that wasn't a challenge that I was willing to, to accept. Um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to have joined the American Ballet Theater at a time where other young people were rising to that occasion. And I've since gone all the way to the top to enjoy what that kind of sacrifice looks like. Um, I knew that my energies would be better spent and I knew that um, I would get much more pride out of, out of passing that discipline on to the next generation um, and opening their eyes to, to what, they're, what you're signing up for. You know, when we get our young people 
from three to five to even eight years old, we're really just trying to establish a love of dance. Um, dance is fun, um, dancing with your imagination. But shortly thereafter, you know, nine onwards up, 15, 16, it, it starts to get very serious um, because you have to start making some decisions. Are you going to go an academic route or are you gonna go a pre-professional route? And if you wanna go a pre-professional route, th these are the sacrifices you're gonna have to make um, to do it. Um, which, which really is training a whole dancer. As a dancer explores their gift, in the very beginning they're getting the fundamentals and they're learning and, and their technique is developing and they're developing as a dancer. However, as they move along in years and they move along in life and they move along with their blessed gift and then all of a sudden the emotional factors into the equation, the, the emotional um, maturity factors into the equation. Speak to how they bring that together. As we had talked about prior to the broadcast, you might be a child prodigy and you're doing all these fantastic, remarkable, magnificent instructions that your dance instructor passes on to your teacher passes on to you. However, later as you mature, how does that all come together? Um, I'm, 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 I, I'm, I would tend to think it's more of a moving target in that it can come together for one production and maybe not come together for another. And that's what artists are chasing is how to, how to maintain that consistency over the long haul. Um, what, what I see in our young people from year to year as they become more technically proficient in classical ballet, they're able to execute steps and therefore um, tell the ballet in a different way, in a different story. And sometimes um, they, they have the right emotion, they have the right technique, um, it's the right day and it comes together and it's really wonderful. And then sometimes they feel like they've missed it. Um, I, I don't know why I couldn't execute A or I don't know why I couldn't feel X. Um, and then watching the next year um, to see if that, if the, the dedication to achieve that desired outcome is something that they'll be able to, to um, enjoy. Um, you talk about child prodigies. When you look at like, some prodigies still dancing today, like Carlos Acosta, a huge national star in Cuba who went on to perform with the, Amer with the Royal Ballet in uh, London, who was a guest dancer with the American Ballet Theater. I was able to take private classes with him. If you look at Sylvie Guillaume, a young lady who, when she was 16, was promoted to Etoile, the highest level of the Paris Opera Ballet by Rudolf Nureyev. Nureyev, arguably another prodigy on and to himself. Um, you can see that from a very young age, the, the technique was there. They both were clearly trained well enough to dance ballet, but it's, it's their circumstances that, um, in their life, the context of how they were training and where they were performing, which started to add color and vigor to their performance. And every performance was different. You, there was never an aha moment where, oh, now, now Carlos is on it, he's gonna be on it, um, because the next show, you didn't, you didn't get that same fire, that same fury. Um, when you watch um, how he first left Cuba and was able to dance in Texas, how much more of a strained dancer he was. His technique was just still amazing. Um, young dancers like us, when you had to have a VHS tape and the, the arm mount to go and capture it, did exactly that. Um, and then you see the shift in him when he goes to Royal Ballet and he's being appreciated um, beyond the color of his skin and technique, but for the talent he's bringing to the stage, which transformed him, I think, as a dancer. And now that he's moved on from the Royal Ballet, his focus in Cuba is creating a school and creating opportunity for other young Cubans to get out of Cuba, to travel and to train. Um, same with Sylvie Guillaume. You can see that the technique was there. It was always there, it was clearly there. Um, but after Nureyev passed away and after the shift in upper management at the Paris Opera Ballet, you can see um, Sylvie's um, rejection of the classicism that Paris Opera Ballet was offering to the point where she basically shaved her head so the company would release her from her contract and then she hit the modern scene and she was dynamic. She is one of the most phenomenal um, ballerinas um, still living and still performing today. Um, so to see, to see those types of prodigies um, in, in their early life is, is really, really fascinating. Um, I know that our young people, when they look back, 
they'll have those aha moments where, you know, I was doing this variation better when I was eight than when I'm 23. And yeah, sometimes that happens because of the emotions you had when you were eight were just to technically execute a step and people can appreciate it at face value as opposed to, you know, I can't pay my bills right now and I missed the train and I, I'm late for a half hour and I forgot the shoe and I have to go on stage and perform <laughs> anyway and look like there's nothing wrong and have that, have that come together. And then to do the Nutcracker, if you had told me 27 years ago, you know, you're gonna be listening to this music for the rest of your life, that one, I wouldn't have had an aha moment and then maybe second guessed what I was doing. Um, I did have people tell me that at some point in your life you're gonna be sick of this music. This Nutcracker is gonna get to the point where you're just, you can't listen to it anymore. It's a job, it's a job. And uh, when I look back, those people are no longer dancing or active in the dance field. They've transitioned out. And I'm still appreciating the Nutcracker music for what it is, which is really a timeless classic um, and an opportunity for each generation to have that first, for a lot of kids, Nutcracker is their earliest exposure to any kind of dance um, in the Harvard Public School system. And um, to have been on the other side of that, to have been Fritz when the Harvard Public Schools were being bussed to the Bushnell to watch a Nutcracker uh, changed my life. And uh, I've been enjoying the music ever since, um, especially when our, our young dancers um, get to repeat roles. They get to repeat roles of Clara. They get to repeat roles of Sugar Plum and bring who they are this year to that role, which is a completely different person. Um, and I suspect as time goes on and you dance it later in life as opposed to earlier, you're always, even probably to this day, you're probably experiencing new thoughts, new ideas, new dimensions of how to approach how to dance it. That's exactly right. And um, as, as, a, as a retired dancer, um, sometimes I can get overzealous with my students and start executing steps and then I realize, you know, where I lack in the training, uh, the day-to-day -day training from my own plies and my own tendus and I, and I feel it in the morning. Um, uh, watching people who come and train with us um, get better, get better, get better and surpass where you were as a student and you know, they're going to surpass where you were as a professional dancer, um, which, is, which really is a huge unintended consequence for training on people, for exposing them, for watching them. Um, accept the challenge of, of the life that this is going to lead, the discipline that it's going to take, um, the hard work that they're going to have to put into it. Um, but knowing that if they're willing to work, we're going to be there for them to hold that ladder, to keep that door open so that they can go further than even I could have ever dreamed for them. And they could possibly have, have ever dreamed for themselves. I don't know that um, our growth as humans is a, is a is a straight line. I feel like <laughs> we, we succeed and then we succeed and then we succeed and then we succeed. Um, so as a young person sorting through life and getting, getting on track, staying focused about what you'd like to do um, uh, is, is, is also part of the fun, part of the challenge. I've asked musicians this, I've asked actors this, I've asked sculptors this. Are you born with an innate talent ballet? Uh, just two years ago I would have said no but um, my wife and I two years ago uh, welcomed a son into this world and he's been fortunate enough to grow up in the dance studio and um, I don't know too many two-year-olds or maybe I'm just one of those parents my son my daughter but uh, he um, has embraced what he sees in the studio and when you play the Nutcracker music he dances it He's doing pirouettes. His motor function skills are, are very, very high. He can remember choreography from different productions. Um, and he can call, in some cases, the, what he's seeing by name. Um, so that, that's certainly the, the, the nature versus nurture. And he's certainly in an environment doing both. Um, of course, he's going to be a hedge fund manager. He just, he just <laughs> doesn't know it yet. Um, <laughs> but I, I think children can be born into a situation where they can appreciate music, jazz, they can appreciate art and literature, they can appreciate dance, sciences, math even, um, if, they're, if, they're, if they're exposed to it. And I, I think um, watching uh, what it's meant to my son, how much he's embraced dancing in his car seat, dancing in the studio, throwing glitter like Drosselmeyer, um, that it's, it's, we have to, as, as the senior generation, expose young people to it. It's the exposure that the kids need in order to, to soak it up like a sponge and grow. Um, 
With the moment we have remaining, in summation, survey for me where dance is today, the differences, where it's going, what's taking place. So um, where dance is today is, uh, I think, a lot further than we were even just 10 years ago. Dancers are still breaking boundaries, um, becoming uh, principal dancers with regional companies, with foreign companies. I think the social media platform has forever altered um, the landscape. People are able to share in real time ballet classes, performances, rehearsals. Um, young dancers are able to have immediate exposure um, and see immediate results in some cases for the time that they do sacrifice on to, to get on stage to be professional dancers. Uh, I think we're in a much better place. I think we're in a much better place because the, the, ex the exposure of the arts is, is, brighter, is brighter today as it's ever been. Um, and I don't see it growing dim anytime soon. Executive and Artistic Director of the Harvard City Ballet, D'Artagnan Reed, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Pleasure, <laughs> pleasure. And thank you for joining us. I'm Litch for Talk About Our Times. See you next time. Until then, keep me in your thoughts. <laughs>